A casual glance at my video output from before 2024 makes it pretty obvious how much I love boss fights. I guess there's just something about the idea of a super strong encounter at the end of a gauntlet of generic goons that really appeals to me. Fighting games though, it's a bit of a different story. Bosses and FGs, particularly those from the arcade era, are known for being absolute quarter stealers that cause even the most pious of arcade goers to experience rage and salt that Dark Side Phil would call excessive. Given how a lot of these early fighters would cheat you out of your hard-earned money with CPUs that would read your moves or just straight up cheat, it's no surprise developers back then were evil enough to include an unplayable boss that would wreck your shit harder than anything that came before them in the arcade mode, and that's the focus of today's video. However, I think it would be pretty boring if I just droned on about unplayable bosses and why they were cheap. Many of these bosses ended up becoming popular in their own right, causing them to become regular playable characters in future games, so I thought it would be fun to examine some of these boss characters and see how well they made the transition from boss to playable character. The human era is over. The mutant era has come. When Capcom made a fighting game based on Marvel's X-Men, there was no one better suited to taking the place of final boss than Magneto. The Master of Magnet certainly isn't messing around here. If you've got the guts to power through even the unstoppable juggernaut to make it to Magneto, know that your journey's end will likely end up being the hardest part by far. Magneto is very broken. That much is evident when you're fighting him and he's flying at the top of the screen, timing you out while simultaneously raining projectiles down on your head, but playing as him thanks to either ROM hacks or one of the different ports of the game that allows him to be selected really brings to light how insane Children of the Atom Magneto really is. Some elements of the character Magneto would become our present here, with some of his iconic specials making their debut, and his fast dash speed too, but whereas playable versions of Magneto in the Versus series are defined by high speed rushdown, Coda Magneto I think is more notable for his incredibly unhinged projectile game. EM Disruptor and Magnetic Blast are staple parts of his kit, but the thing about them in Children of the Atom is that they're technically normals, activated with a single button press. Ground Disruptor is standing Heavy Punch, Air Disruptor is jumping Medium Punch, and Magnetic Blast is jumping Heavy Punch. This is particularly important for Magnetic Blast because there's no upper limit on how many you can throw, so you can jump or fly and just huck them down, it's hilarious. He's got some other projectiles in his kit that allow for a strong ranged game. Hypergrav is a tracking projectile that captures the opponent allowing for follow up combos. In Coda, it's unblockable, so good luck with that shit. Magneto's extremely strong ranged abilities are compounded by his very high damage. Many of his normals just do seemingly unreasonable amounts of damage, probably because he's a boss, and he's got his fair share of infinites. Now infinites in this game are not an uncommon thing, but keep in mind Magneto has these infinites in conjunction with everything else that makes him broken. Strong specials are one thing, but Magneto has ways to break the game with the meter he can spend. His super, Magnetic Shockwave, is a full screen super that does dummy damage on full connecting can be comboed off of for more damage yet. However, meter and coda can be spent not just on supers, but also X abilities. X abilities can range from things like Storm and Sentinel's Flight or installs like Wolverine's Berserker Charge. Magneto has two of them. The first is Flight, which works as you'd expect and is particularly strong thanks to the aforementioned Magnetic Blast. The other is the Force Field, which surrounds Magneto for around 15 seconds. While this Force Field is active, Magneto is immune to strikes, immune to projectiles, he can't be thrown. He is, for all intents and purposes, completely invincible during the super. Now, to be fair to Capcom, there are two limitations put in to make this overpowered as fuck ability slightly less overpowered. One is that Magneto can only use it once per round. Okay, that's decent, I guess. The other is that it costs meter, and you know, this might have been a decent balance choice if not for what might be Magneto's most broken ability in Coda. During the course of a fight, Magneto will passively gain meter. He gets bar just for existing. That is just not fair. I guess the strat is to try and lame him out while it's up, which might have worked better if he didn't have a tracking unblockable projectile that yoinks you and brings your sorry ass right to him. It does prevent some of his normals from being able to hit as he can't move outside of the field's range, but for a character with projectiles that's hardly an issue. Also he can combo off his throw. Coda Magneto is frankly terrifying thanks to these overtly broken boss abilities, and he's commonly banned in tournaments due to how he breaks the game, figuratively and, in some cases, literally. One year after Children of the Atom, Capcom released Marvel Super Heroes. This game features more characters from other Marvel comic series, but it did bring back a few characters from Children of the Atom's roster, including the two bosses, Juggernaut and Magneto. In order to properly integrate Mags into the role of playable character, he was changed in many ways. EM Disruptor and Magnetic Blast now have motion inputs. Blast in particular suffers because of this as the input itself is very awkward and they're also much slower to toss out now. 
Making the transition to regular member of the cast, MSH Magneto was nerfed in numerous ways. Hypergrab was made blockable, Disruptor and Magnetic Blast are way less spammable since they're no longer activated by a single button press, and he no longer has the passive meter regeneration. The force field is still present, but it's way less accessible for him to use as it's tied to the Infinity Gems. Every gem has a general effect that will boost most of the cast upon activation, but every character has a gem that will grant a unique benefit. For Magneto, the Space Gem's normal effect of Super Armor is tossed aside for the Force Field, which is still immune to damage, but it doesn't last nearly as long. The already shortened duration can be further dwindled by attacking the barrier, which makes it way less practical. In MSH, he's just okay. The Versus series, however, is where Magneto as a playable character started to really shine. X-Men vs Street Fighter gave Magneto a simple buff that would go on to define his gameplay. In this game, he was granted the ability to perform an 8-way air dash. In addition to improving his already strong mobility, Magneto's air dash enabled some terrifying high-low mix-ups as he can perform his air normals, which hit his overheads, very close to the ground, allowing him to go for double overhead or overhead low. That's on top of his strong and flexible combo game and myriad of infinites. MVC2 Magneto is easily the most iconic version of the character. In this game, he's a group of four, or five depending on what the person you're asking thinks of Iron Man, characters known as the God Tears. These are the kings and queen of the meta, and for Magneto, his claim to the throne is that same time-tested rushdown gameplay taken to his logical extreme. His swift mobility and air dash makes his movement absolutely vicious, and his combos haven't lost their luster. Combos like the ROM Infinite allow him to run a train of mix-ups and resets and obliterate health bars in no time flat, and with the right assist, it's very easy to convert into these combos. Magneto is a staple of the Marvel 2 meta, prominent in the olden days thanks to the likes of Justin Wong and Yipes, and still holding that spot to this day. However, in saying that, it's worth mentioning that Magneto is also a very high execution character, between the need to execute fast air dashes and his combos being fairly difficult to pull off as well. Also, he does have low defense. In Marvel 3, he's basically unchanged conceptually. He's still a high-speed character with incredible mix-up potential, but low health and high execution requirements. Even though his rushdown is still strong, he's a little more versatile here as the speed of Magnetic Blast and EM Disruptor lets him do some solid zoning when combined with his flight and fast air movement. He's still very strong, make no mistake, and you can watch the likes of Ray Ray and Filipino Champ for confirmation. So, Magneto. Was he stronger as a boss or a playable character? Honestly, it's hard for me to say. He's been super strong in basically all the games he's playable in besides Marvel superheroes. But Coda Magneto is just stupid busted. Infinites are cool, but a force field that says no to everything? That's pretty broken. Funnily enough, the force field in the Versus games is just a strike counter that's worthless. Either way, I think this segment should have made one thing clear. You don't mess with Mag fucking Nito. Speaking of Marvel superheroes, since Magneto obviously got demoted from boss status and they had access to a larger pool of Marvel IPs, Capcom gave us a new boss character, Thanos. And Thanos is also very stupid, with high damage combos and some very strong specials and supers. He has 5 supers with many of them having monstrous output, one being able to heal you and one which slows the opponent down. His two specials are the Titan Crush, which also hits real hard, and the Bubble. Unlike his other strong projectiles, this bubble captures the opponent for a free combo. He's a very powerful pick, but unlike Magneto, he certainly didn't retain that power in future appearances. Well, for one, after Marvel Super Heroes, he just disappeared off the face of the earth until MVC2. Much like with Magneto and MSH, he was nerfed from boss character status, with lots of his tools either being removed or toned down heavily, and he's pretty handicapped compared to most of the roster. First off, his screen presence is pretty poor. Many of the moves he lost going from MSH to MVC2 were projectiles, including his standing and heavy crouching kick from that game, which means he's left with relatively stubby normals, his dash which is okay, and some specials that he can use to move through the air. His mobility as a whole is poor, especially in midair, and he also doesn't have an air throw, so he's pretty worthless once he leaves the ground. Death Sphere is a legitimately strong special and also a great assist, and it even enables a corner infinite, and to Thanos' credit, he has really strong supers. That certainly wasn't changed when he got demoted from boss status. He can still heal with the Soul Stone Super, and the Power Stone Super is gargantuan and does real good damage. However, these really don't help him as much as you'd want since it creates maybe his biggest problem, his reliance on meter. Stealing this one from myself, but Thanos with meter and without it are two very different characters, and when he's at his most vulnerable, the results are fucking miserable. Since he needs meter so badly and his bubble assist is genuinely really good, most teams place him as a middle or anchor. I've talked about him in prior videos, so check those out for a more detailed analysis. The other game Thanos was in was Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. A lot of people criticize this game as being a marketing vehicle for the Marvel Cinematic Universe, so seeing him return here is not surprising. 
Admittedly, I'm not super familiar with this game, but the general consensus I've seen is that Thanos in this game is... Eh. Not great, but not terrible. I've seen some people put him as bottom 10, while other lists have him stuck in the middle. Although, it's worth noting that Thanos in this game is also a very, very different character. He has completely different specials, including a command throw and a teleport, some fancy new command normals and supers, an air dash, and a totally different game plan. Good to see that he's not a bubble-blowing baby anymore, but also a definitive showing of how much weaker he was once Capcom took him off the throne. Maybe next time, big guy. M. Bison is one of the most iconic Street Fighter characters and one of gaming's most endearing villains and I don't really feel like talking about him. So instead, let's talk about this blue and red prick. Since Capcom wanted to create a whole host of new characters for the SF3 series, it only makes sense they'd make a new boss. Gil is the final boss of every Street Fighter 3 game, and regardless of which one you're playing, he's probably kicking your ass, although I'm going to be primarily focusing on Third Strike Gil. The first standout property of Mr. Bomb Pop is conveniently located right on his body. Believe it or not, Gil's body isn't just painted to signal his allegiance to a football team, but rather it's an allusion to his elemental powers. He controls fire and ice, and in gameplay this is reflected through a very unique mechanic. Some of Gil's attacks have fire and ice properties, but this will actually change based on what side he's on. On player 1, his fireball is pyrokinesis, and on player 2's side, it's cryokinesis. Other attacks affected by this are his standing and crouching heavy punch and kick, and his lariat. Fire attacks behave pretty standard on Connect, but some of Gil's ice attacks cause a unique frozen state. This changes things primarily for Gil's combos, as based on what side of the stage he's on, certain combos will or won't work and will have to be adjusted for the differences between the fire and ice states. Anyway, the funny thing about Gil is that we have a pretty good way of gauging why he's so overpowered since he's very, very similar to another character on the roster, Yurian. Yurian was added to the SF3 series in Second Impact, and he's actually Gil's brother. The two share many normals and animations, as well as specials. The main difference is that Gills are just juiced up in numerous ways, and comparing the two, Gills often have higher damage and stun, and blatantly superior frame data. That part is kind of funny in of itself, as Yurian's normals are pretty unremarkable for the most part when removed from what they contribute to his Aegis Reflector setups. Gil doesn't have those, but he obviously doesn't need them. A few fun examples. Yurian's Crouch Medium Punch is a solid poke, albeit with fairly slow startup at 11 frames. Gil's Crouch Medium Punch is not only much faster at 6 frame startup, it does more damage and stun and has a much better hitbox. Yurian's 9 frame Crouch Heavy Punch gives way to a 5 frame Crouch Heavy Punch for Gil, Gil's Sweep is 7 frame startup to Yurian's 12, and my favorite, Yurian has a 7 frame Crouching Medium Kick. Respectable numbers for a pretty long range normal. Gil's has a smaller hurtbox, so it's harder to whiff punish, and it's 2 frame startup. Now, I'll be honest here, I don't have much Third Strike experience, or SF experience in general. I'm a 6 baby, and the idea of a 2MK that's that fast kinda makes me want to vomit. Unfortunately, while these normals will chunk you on hit and do plenty of stun all the same, many of them aren't special cancelable. That's one of the things that makes Gil pretty unconventional compared to much of Third Strike's cast. Not that fitting in is what makes Gil so goddamn powerful. Gil has 4 specials, some of which are similar to specials that Yurian has. The strange thing is that one of the biggest differences between the two is the inputs needed to do them. For Yurian, many of his specials are charge, but for Gil, they're motions. I can't think of any other examples of two characters with similar specials where one of the major differences is how they're performed. I'm sure there are more examples, but what a funny little detail. Gil's repertoire of specials includes a solid fireball, a tackle mostly used for combos, a headbutt that's just okay, and a knee drop that is minus on hit to the point that some characters can straight up punish it. The knee drop sucks ass, so don't use it. These may not sound impressive, but he really doesn't need them at all other than the tackle. Gil's supers are what tend to grate on most casual players. Seraphic Wing is the one I've seen most people express hatred for, usually because Gil using it as a boss tends to look like this. The damage output is unbelievable, and even if you try to block it, it does massive chip damage too. However, a slightly deeper look into the super reveals its major flaw, which is the speed. It has incredibly long startup, making it very easy to interrupt on reaction. Even if you try to be clever and do it at full screen, it won't make much of a difference as Gil will float to the center of the screen before the super flash. It's also extremely minus on block, so if it doesn't kill, you will eat a massive punish. A very flashing and devastating super, but in practice it's just a little too risky. Meteor Strike is the less cool but far more practical super. It causes meteors to rain from the sky, with the patterns differing based on the side Gil is facing. 
It's way, way faster than Seraphic Wing, 48 frame startup versus 1 frame, but the meteors do take time to begin raining down. Although the meteor patterns can make it slightly inconsistent, the damage can add up tremendously if enough of them hit, making it a pretty fantastic combo tool. Gil's final super art is the most unique, maybe in the entire game. Resurrection cannot be activated by conventional means. If Gil dies when he has full meter, it will automatically trigger and revive him, while also refilling his health. Sounds pretty busted, and it's the number one thing many casual players hate about Gil. The thing is, this super is pretty bad for two reasons. The first is that Gil is not invincible while recovering his health, which means it's more than possible to hit him out of the move and stop his health regeneration. Even better, you can straight up just kill him while he's resurrecting, basically making the damn thing pointless. What sucks is that you can't even avoid this situation if the opponent knows better, because if Gil has full meter and dies, this super is going to happen. If Gil doesn't get his cheeks clapped while he's healing, he's gotta deal with the other main flaw, which is that after resurrecting, his super meter is broken. He can't gain any bar for the rest of the round, which sucks as he loses access to Meteor Strike. Gil is unique in that he's the only character in the roster with access to all of his supers at once, whereas all the others have three supers, but can normally only pick and use one. He has one long super bar and no EX moves to spend bar on. Resurrection is pretty whack for the most part, but realistically, if you're playing as Gil, you should not be dying. What really seals the deal on Gil's broken nature despite some of his more shit moves is his damage. Mans is a machine that turns 2 HP into easy TODs thanks to his lariat juggles, allowing him to delete almost everyone on the cast. The actual combo he needs to do can change based on character health as the likes of Q and Hugo can increase their vitality by taunting, and some of his combos can vary based on the side he's on due to the different properties of his moves, but Lariat juggles are criminally strong nonetheless. It may seem impractical for Crouching Heavy Punch to be his best starter, it's pretty fast and it has a good hitbox, but the horizontal range definitely leaves something to be desired. However, this is Third Strike, a game where punishes are extremely potent because of the parry system, and Gil is the king of high damage punishes. Even something as safe and non-committal as a jab can be your ticket to death if Gil gets a successful parry, which means the practicality of his damage is legit, and combined with the damage of some of his many good pokes, makes this character a fucking monster. He may be a little weird, but once he gets that touch, he just erases you. I've heard Gil was commonly banned from tournaments, although I'm not sure why that would need to be stated. He's not selectable in the arcade version, which is what I assume most offline tournaments were run on, and that of course means you can't pick him on the version played on Fightcade either. Outside of a glitch, the only way to play as Gil in the arcade version is to use 12's X-Copy Super, which allows him to assume the form of whatever character he's up against, including Gil. Gil was made playable in the home console versions though, so I guess that's where the ban is necessary, as yeah, this character is just flat out unfair. However, the main thing that inspired me to discuss Gil is actually his other major appearance in SF5, where he was obviously heavily nerfed from his days as a boss, but also changed in numerous ways to become a very unique, but also underwhelming character. Gil was released as DLC in this game, still rocking the tidy whiteys but losing some of his overtly broken boss abilities. Resurrection is nowhere to be seen, not when you're playing as him anyway, and Meteor Strike sort of lives on through his V-Skill 1, while Seraphic Wing is now his critical art, and ironically it's actually better. It doesn't have the monstrous damage it touted in Third Strike, but it's way more practical in combo since it doesn't take 50 eons to come out. Gil also has EX moves now, so that's neato. As far as his special moves and normals, they've lost some of their juice obviously, but they still have that beefy range. One of the most interesting things about SF5 Gil is how Capcom handled his elemental gimmick. In Third Strike, his moves changed properties based on the side he was facing, but that system has been abandoned for 5 and his normals now have preset elements. Crouching Heavy Punch is always ice, his sweep is always fire, etc etc. The major exception are his specials. For the fireball and tackle, he now has two versions of both moves, one with the fire element and one with ice. Now pyrokinesis is 236 punch and cryokinesis is 214 punch. The same goes for tackle, but while the two tackles are mostly the same by themselves, the fireballs are actually different. Pyrokinesis travels much faster than cryokinesis, allowing for some tricky zoning as you can really vary up the fireball timing. This is also necessary as the higher button strengths for both don't really affect the travel speed and are more meant to modify the angle at which he fires them. His two V skills are Divine Meteor, which causes a projectile of either fire or ice to fall from the sky, and a parry, taking him back to his SF3 roots. Where Gil starts to stand out in 5 is his two major gimmicks, his debuffs and retribution. Whenever Gil hits with certain fire or ice attacks, it applies a debuff of either element. These have two main purposes, and the first is their passive detriments. While the opponent is on fire, they take continuous gray burn damage, and while they're on ice, 
frozen. Wait, but they can still move. Uh, while the ice debuff is active, their stun bar will be frozen. Whatever stun you've accumulated will normally go down whenever you're not getting hit or blocking, but if you're frozen, it'll remain in that position until the debuff is cleared. The other effect of these debuffs is contributing to retribution. The basic gist is that while a debuff is active, if Gil hits with an attack of the opposite element, that attack will gain enhanced properties, usually allowing for higher juggle potential and more damaging combos. If there's one thing about Gil in 5 that's faithful to his boss incarnation, it's his damage. He may not have those same fat TODs, but he can still hit like a truck. Unfortunately for Gil, he spent most of SF5's lifespan being considered pretty mediocre for a variety of reasons. Being a character that's highly reliant on fireballs can be tough as SF5 was full of strong anti-fireball tools and he didn't really have the buttons to compensate, but the cracks run much deeper. First off, the retribution mechanic was very finicky and costly in the early days of the character. The only moves Gil has that inflict his debuffs are his EX fireballs, EX tackles, V skill 1, and both V triggers. Now, to be fair, his V triggers are both incredible. The Fire Javelin from Trigger 1 and the Ice Tree and Traps from Trigger 2 are all amazing moves, but the fact was that he had to spend resources he didn't have at the beginning of matches to get his game going. Later patches did address this. Not only was his weak V-Skill 1 buffed tremendously, but he was also given charged versions of his heavy normals that inflict the debuffs on hit, and that helped him a lot, but it doesn't address the biggest flaw of Gil. You see, the retribution mechanic exists to compensate for his biggest problem. In SF5, if certain normals hit as counter hit, they become crush counters. Crush counters allow normals to take on new properties, often allowing for greater reward off of a counter hit, including higher damage and V meter build. Most characters have two or three normals that cause a crush counter. Wanna guess how many Gil has? Try fucking zero. This makes Gil much less threatening in neutral, and while the retribution mechanic does somewhat make up for it and gives him his own unique strengths, he is ultimately dealing with a problem no one else on the roster has to contend with. Still, like I said, he was buffed a lot in patches after his release and he still got that fat damage and strong zoning. Definitely not the same beast he was in Street Fighter 3 though. One final, funny tidbit I want to mention. So Capcom released a batch of Halloween themed costumes for many of the characters. Yeah, Capcom releasing costumes in a Street Fighter game, crazy I know. Anyway, Yurian's Halloween costume causes him to resemble Gil. However, in 2020, this costume was banned from being used in the Capcom Pro Tour. I guess for the reason that Gil was in the game by this point and they wanted to avoid confusion between the two? That's very funny. In Heritage for the Future, the final boss of most characters' arcade routes is Dio, but since he's also a playable character, and there's no real difference between his boss and playable form ignoring Jacket Dio, let's talk about Vanilla Ice instead. In the first version of the game, JoJo's Venture, Vanilla Ice, despite being a pretty major antagonist, was only present as an unplayable boss character. I guess Midler, Chaka, and Alessi were just higher on the devs' list of priorities for some reason. He was made into a standard playable character in the second version of the game, Heritage for the Future, but the cool thing is that the unplayable boss version is still present and we can play as him using debug tools, allowing for a pretty solid comparison between the two. The boss version of Vanilla Ice is usually referred to as Boss Ice or Vice, so that's what I'll be calling him to avoid confusion. I'll be calling the playable version Vice just for reference. Bice is a weird boss because even more so than someone like Kodo Magneto, it's evident that the developers never intended for him to be played as. He has a very limited moveset and his AI doesn't really control him like a normal character. Just fighting him in arcade mode kinda makes that obvious as he's very passive, occasionally throwing out a normal or a very delayed special, but mostly just blocking your attacks. However, if you decide to control him, you'll find that he's even more unorthodox in the hands of a player. First off, if there's one thing that's actually pretty good about him, it's his mobility. His ground dashes are very fast and cover a large distance, a trait that Vice would end up inheriting. Vice's rolls are also real fast. On the other hand, he has a pretty big flaw in the fact that he cannot crouch. Oh, he can still crouch block, so he doesn't get destroyed by lows, but holding down literally does nothing as he'll still stand tall. Good for him, but it also weakens his game. Vice by himself probably has like, maybe a little over 5 unique attacks, so his normals tend to look very similar to each other due to all their reused animations and they don't have much utility. His frame data is generally sluggish, with his 5A, usually a character's fastest standoff normal, being 8 frame startup, whereas for lots of other characters the standard is 3 frames, a pretty big difference. It is an overhead, but Bice only has one low in the form of his 5C as well as the dashing variation, so he doesn't have much mix-up potential to take advantage of. He does have some pretty fast air normals though. 
Another issue with the standoff normals is that most of them launch, meaning his standoff combo potential is extremely limited as you can tech out of most of his normals before he has a chance to connect with another. Where he admittedly does get a little better is his stand on normals. Yes, he does have a stand on mode, and not only is this where the majority of his combo potential lies, but also his meter building potential. Stand 5A is 5 frame startup and it whiffs extremely fast, allowing him to build mad meter in a matter of mere seconds. Meter he doesn't really have much use for, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Another highlight of his is his full screen stand 6C. He has one special where Cream eats him and the two travel across the screen, with different variations that change the pattern they travel in. It deals tremendous damage not just to health bars, but also stand gauges, and it's unblockable. Problem is, it's real easy to avoid. There are some tricky patterns, one of which travels in a worm-like way, and one of which you can use to have them reappear from just behind the opponent. In many other games, these might have been real strong, but the issue is that in JoJo, you can roll by pressing all three attack buttons. It's extremely easy to avoid Bice's specials by just reacting to the lengthy 81 frame startup and just rolling when you see him pop on screen, and these specials are heavily punishable on whiff. The few supers he has are also very easy to avoid. Bice actually does have a tandem, but due to his poor stand on normals, he can't really take advantage of it. The main strength Bice has that really only exists when you play as him is his stand on combos. He has pretty high combo damage as his normals don't scale, including an infinite with stand 6B into itself. Also his guard cancel is surprisingly good. Obviously Bice isn't very strong on his own merits, so how does he compare to the playable Vice that was added in Heritage for the future? <laughs> Do I even have to say this? Obviously Vice is one of the most broken characters in Heritage, and comparing him to Vice really makes it easy to see just how privileged Vice is. Since Vice is meant to be a properly selectable character, he has a more conventional and complete set of normals, and a damn good one at that. He does appear to share some animations with Vice, but that's about the only similarity. Vice's incredible jabs, hit confirmable 6C, and strong air to airs, as well as great dashing normals, are staples of what makes him so powerful in Stand Off. Compared to Vice, Vice's Stand On is completely different. Instead of having Cream awkwardly float next to him, Vice in Stand On is swallowed up by Cream. In this state, Vice has an air dash, giving him wonderful mobility, and his normals are amazing, with great hitboxes and high damage. Vice probably has better standoff mobility, but Vice's fast dashes and rolls make him no slouch either. Vice may have high damage combos to brag about, but Vice has damage to match, and unlike Vice, his combo potential in standoff is incredible thanks to having a better tandem. Also, of course, there's the one thing that makes Vice so infamous, his Okizeme. Vice's pressure on Wake Up is absolutely incredible thanks to the unblockables with his fancy new 214A, allowing him to eliminate health bars with no issue. He actually does have a similar special to Vice's, but Vice's dark space is actually quite decent as depending on the version, you have more control over where it travels, and Vice's doesn't take nearly as long to start up. On top of that, Vice has some nifty new supers, including Circle Locust, which is an absolutely incredible anti-air and combo ender. Comparing these two is hilarious, as Vice's playable strengths far trump anything Vice can do, which is pretty strange for a boss character. I've talked at length about Vice before, and I may discuss Vice further, so you might get to hear about this weirdo sometime in the future. So obviously I couldn't make a video like this without talking about Mortal Kombat. It's like the poster child for obnoxious single player modes and AI bullshit, not to mention cheap unplayable bosses. There are lots of contenders in that alley, but no one comes quite close to Shao Kahn, the ruler of Outworld. Shao Kahn made his debut in Mortal Kombat 2 as the final boss and also filled that spot in Mortal Kombat 3, and it takes like 10 seconds to realize why this guy is such a jerk off. Sporting massive damage and plenty of cheap moves, Shao Kahn really doesn't spare any mercy when it comes to beating your ass. In terms of his actual moves, he's blessed with a projectile, a shoulder charge, an upward knee charge, and of course, the hammer slammer which stuns on hit. All of these, as well as his normals, absolutely chunk your health, and when combined with the move reading AI, yeah, it's not a fun time. His frame data seems absolutely juiced on block, leading to some borderline block string infinites. He's also more durable than most regular characters, so good luck taking him out. The only real blip in his strategy to take all your quarters is that his AI can be fairly exploitable. It seems rather inconsistent because sometimes he'll absolutely tear you apart without mercy, and other times he'll just throw away his health doing the highly punishable on whiff up knee charge. 
Shao Kahn also loves to taunt, and as insulting as it is, it's also basically him just giving you a free shot. Oh, yeah, and I don't have footage of this, but he was also a boss in Mortal Kombat 2011, and he's pretty busted in that game too. An unblockable projectile, multiple infinites, armor, all the good stuff. Now, as far as playable appearances, Shao's had a pretty polarizing career. He was actually playable in some of the home console versions of Mortal Kombat 3, but our first stop proper is going to be Mortal Kombat Trilogy. This is a bit of an odd game, using a slightly tweaked gameplay style from Mortal Kombat 3 and its update Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3, but also adding quite a few new characters. The most novel part though is that they basically added every boss from the original trilogy of MK arcade games to the playable roster, so you can pick them at your leisure. And rest assured, they were not balanced at all for this sake. Shao Kahn in Trilogy is basically a playable boss, and yeah, he's as busted as he looks. He still has that high damage, the insane specials, the high health, everything. Bosses in this game can't really combo like the rest of the cast can, and Shao can't run either, but his fast walk speed makes up for it slightly, and he hardly needs the ability to combo when one hit does so much damage. Shao Kahn can also jump in this game, something I don't believe he ever does as a boss in MK2 or 3 unless I'm mistaken, but this exposes probably his biggest issue, which is his utter lack of air normals. Shao believes in grounded footsies, and I respect it, but I don't respect anything else about the guy. Now as far as future showings where he was actually balanced, Shao's had two notoriously poor incarnations. The first was in Mortal Kombat Deception, where he was added in the GameCube version of the game along with Goro to compensate for that version's late release and lack of online functionality compared to the PS2 and Xbox versions. Unfortunately, Shao Kahn in this game kinda sucks. This era of MK changed the gameplay up quite a bit, effectively making it into a 3D fighter with sidesteps. The defining gameplay gimmick was that every character had two fighting styles and a weapon which changed their buttons and strings, but Khan's fighting styles aren't anything particularly great. He has pretty bad low pokes with poor reward and some dysfunctional strings. The worst of them will just not connect halfway through and whiff, and many are also pretty unsafe on block, making for lots of holes in his offense. His specials are decent, but none of them stand out in particular, which isn't very reassuring in the same game where Dyro has an unblockable full screen ground pound that launches you for a combo. Maybe his biggest flaw is his throw, which is absolutely atrocious. For one, it's bugged and deals extremely low damage. Now, this may not seem like a major issue, but throws are actually really important in Deception. Deception doesn't have throw teching, and many characters can exploit this by using plus frames to set up a guaranteed throw, but Shao can't take advantage of this because of his throw's piss poor damage. He also knocks the opponent very far away after a throw, so he doesn't even get Okizema off of it to compensate. So yeah, pretty bad. Armageddon, which was the follow-up to Deception, features Khan once again, but he was buffed in this game, notably with fixing his throw. On the NRS side of things, we have MK11. In this game, Shao Kahn is really no different from how he always is. That is to say, he's a big jerk, but in this game he was also considered a low tier for much of its lifespan, with some players considering him the worst character in the game. He's still bashing your head in with a hammer, and his damage potential is absolutely huge, but he was afflicted with some pretty severe issues for a long period of time. His mids were bad, his frame data as a whole was pretty sluggish, and he had some pretty poor special moves. His taunts returned as an equipable special, but they have 94 frames of recovery, which isn't exactly practical. Many of his strings were also particularly weak to being flawless blocked due to the gaps between them. He did get lots of buffs throughout the game's lifespan though, which I'm sure helped. It's pretty interesting to see how this character evolved considering sometimes he was just a playable boss that was completely overpowered, and then other times the developers tried to turn him into an actual character and they fumbled it. Oh, and in case you're wondering why I didn't discuss Shao Kahn in Mortal Kombat 1, well, that character is called General Shao, not Shao Kahn. Totally different character so he doesn't count. This is not me just bowing out of spending another $50 on this video. If I don't talk about SNK in a video like this, the world will friggin' explode. The term SNK boss syndrome was literally coined from their proficiency at designing bosses that made you want to tear your head off. And I mean, who better to end this video off than Geese Howard? He's like SNK's M. Bison or Shang Tsung. He's the OG, and no matter how many times you toss him off a skyscraper, he'll always come back usually with a $5-$7.99 USD price tag, but hey, formalities. Geese made his presence known in the first Fatal Fury as he taunts you throughout your arcade run before you face him, and many of the things that made him an infamous character are present here as a boss. His projectile, the Repukin, travels along the ground, all while doing serious damage, and his anti-airs will make you reconsider jumping over them. What really seals the deal, of course, is his parries. His strike counters will shut down your pokes and jump-ins and deliver a devastating blow, all while letting you hear that awesome voice line. Unpredictable! 
I think there's something to be said about how insanely memorable it is losing to the final boss of an arcade game and getting thrown out of a fucking building for your troubles. That's the kind of thing that sticks with you, regardless of how empty your pockets are after the experience. Geese was also the final boss of real bout Fatal Fury, where his strategy is fairly similar but I feel like he's even harder in this game. Everything this dude has chunks you and his AI is pretty obnoxious with the counters. His iconic Raging Storm Super will also make you miss the seconds before it hit when you weren't down on half your health. I suppose the only blip in his strategy is his crippling weakness to sweeps. Geese has been a boss in his fair share of games, but let's look at some of his playable appearances. In Fatal Fury Special he's a solid mid-tier, but what really sticks out was Real Bout Fatal Fury 2, where Geese is a top-tier powerhouse. Geese boasts one of the strongest overall offensive presences in this game thanks to his incredible normals and pressure. His 4B in particular stands out being a plus on block, forward advancing kick that really opens up his pressure game since he can car or cancel it into his command throws. Combined with his feints, it makes defending against Geese quite scary. What really seals the deal is his pursuit attack, which does great damage and gives him very consistent offense. He still has his Rapukin as a tool to control space and those counters are as crisp as ever and when combined with strong normals and good command throws, makes Geese deserving of his spot in the upper echelons of the tiers in this game. As far as other SNK outings, Geese has made his fair share of appearances in the King of Fighters series. In KOF 98 UM, there are two versions of Geese. The normal version of Geese's Rapukin is a little different as it doesn't really travel, making it a very short ranged projectile. He also has a DP. EX Geese is the alternative for those who want a more traditional Geese with his Fireball and Air Fireball. Both are very good. Regular Geese's short range Rapukin gives him great pressure while EX Geese is a strong zoner. From the old to the new, Geese continues to appear in later KOF games like 14 and 15, and in the current patch of 15, he's easily one of the best characters in the game and a fairly common top tier pick at the highest level, with both EVO 2024 finalists Zhao Hai and ET using him on their teams. Geese in 15 has many of his iconic moves, his fireballs, his counters, his OTG throw, but 14 gave him an overhead and a Rekka and both of these are trademark moves for him in 15. Geese's Rekka gives him some of the safest and scariest pressure in the game, allowing him to eat away at your guard bar while forcing you to take risks to contest him, and once he gets a hit, he can cash out for big damage. Rapukin and his long range sweep makes his neutral quite scary, and on defense, his counters allow him to call out reckless buttons. He's a fantastic character who packs strong offense and defense into a pretty outstanding package. He's simple, for sure, but powerful nonetheless. And I mean, look at that suit. Man beats you into the ground and looks dapper doing it. Geese has been around the block when it comes to SNK's own library, but because they recognize that he's easily one of the coldest motherfuckers to ever be in a fighting game, Geese has also been in some crossover games. Capcom vs SNK 2 is the game I know him from before getting into games like Garo and KOF 15, and Capcom's take on Mr. Howard is certainly no slouch either. CVS 2's defining mechanic is the six grooves which change many aspects of the system, and Geese finds himself most at home with K-Groove. He gets a powerful defensive tool in Just Defend to complement his parries and a rage bar to push his damage past the limit of insanity. Even taking into account equal ratio levels, Geese is a damage monster in this game. His deadly rave super in particular allows him to cash out on rage mode to just melt you. Not only does he do mad damage, but he shreds guard bars making him amazing at guard crushing. Defense against Geese is almost as scary as getting hit by him. On the SNK side of things, he was in SVC Chaos, and he's one of, if not the best character in the game. Geese is most known for his high damage combos and great buttons. Combos into Raging Storm and an Infinite makes him one of the hardest hitters in the roster, allowing him to decide games in just a single touch. Geese was in Tekken. Added as DLC for Tekken 7, it's pretty surreal to see a character from a 2D game in this series, but between him and Akuma, I guess Harada didn't care much about that. I'm sure the transition into what's essentially an entirely new kind of game must have been difficult for him and... Oh, he's top tier in this game too? Okay. Geese in this game has all the moves he's known for, including his fireball, not a terribly common thing to see in Tekken. However, a mechanic unique to him is his meter, which allows him to activate max mode and use EX versions of his specials, as well as some supers. He can also cancel his buttons into max mode like in KOF. Geese was an absolute animal in this game, and while Patches shook up his position on the tiers over the years, he was a strong pick for quite some time. God damn! While not quite top tier in every game he's in, he's got a pretty strong resume as both a boss and playable character. Impressive for a giant weeb named after a bird. So that's all for now. 
I hope you all enjoyed this look at some different fighting game bosses and how they've stacked up upon becoming regular playable characters. This was a real fun video to make, especially since these kind of unplayable boss characters aren't super duper common in newer fighting games, with some exceptions like King of Fighters 15. Anyway, thanks for watching. Have a great night and take care. Hey everyone, uh, it's that time of the video again, so uh, I'm gonna go through and thank all my YouTube channel members. Thank you to Old Man Han, Cammy the Killer, Jazba, Mortis, Arg Seals, Wormy, Terry Hints, Perfect Orange, Pet Shop from Fortnite, Happy the Hap Hap, HPHK, Gundog92, Isaac the Collector, Kira the Stowaway, and E. Um, so, sorry that this took so long, uh, but I tried to be pretty meticulous with it, so it did end up taking a while to uh, write the script and everything, but uh, I hope it paid off in the end. I really hope you all enjoyed it. It was a very fun video to work on. It's uh, really all I got to say. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Thank you for the support. It means a lot. Uh, I love you all. Thanks for watching. Have a great night and take care.